Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. Well, listeners, welcome to uh, Fortress on a Hill. We have a, uh, a very special episode today that we're putting on for you guys. Um, it's, it's been a long time coming, and we've talked about it for a long time, and we're finally getting to it. Um, we are going to spend the duration today talking about Senator Bernie Sanders and all of the, the good and the bad, uh, the pros and the cons, um, specifically on foreign policy. Not that he doesn't have a lot of good domestic stuff, but that, that's what we, we deal in, and so that's what we're talking about today. Um, before we start talking about it, though, I did want to throw out a few highlights for anybody that isn't super familiar with Bernie and would like a, a, a cursory understanding of why we support him. Um, Bernie did not vote for the Iraq War, something almost every other member of Congress did. Um, he has been unafraid to call out U- U.S. regime change in, in its many forms and something he has done for a long time. Um, He believes wholeheartedly in working to empower and protect the Palestinian people under occupation by Israel, uh, one of only a handful of uh, members of Congress to espouse such beliefs. Um, He has voted no on a huge host of military budget spending bills. Again, probably one of the only people to do that consistently. Um, He is very committed to ensuring the U.S. doesn't go to war with Iran. Um, which has been on everybody's mind lately, especially with the uh, assassination of General Soleimani. Um, He has been a loud critic against the U.S. involvement in the war in Yemen. And my personal favorite thing that I'm sure we'll discuss later at length is that Bernie has said that he will not use the Espionage Act to criminalize whistleblowers. So, um, Danny, why don't you jump in there and... uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, look, those those highlights are are vital, and and they they've informed my um, at first cautious and and of late more full throated support for Bernie. I, I just wanted to say before we jump in, um, I think it's fair for the listeners to know that you know I I've been volunteering for the Bernie campaign in, in limited capacity for uh, the last uh, few months, especially the last few weeks, and so you know take what I say. Uh, not with a grain of salt per, per se, but with the knowledge that you know I, I have uh, a position on this, uh, I am involved, and so there is a degree of bias. And uh, yeah, with that, let's uh, let's jump in. So I want to start with a quote. I, I don't recall when Bernie actually said it, but I think it really informs um, where a lot of his foreign policy positions come from. And he said, "A guy named Adolf Hitler won an election in 1932." He won an election, and 50 million people died as a result of that election in World War II, including 6 million Jews. So what I learned as a little kid is that politics is, in fact, very important. Um, And just a little note with that is that Bernie's family did lose many relatives in uh, German-occupied Poland during the Holocaust. So that, that really gives somebody a front row seat to what American foreign policy and what war in general is, is, is all about. Um, as a high school, uh, a high school student, he ran for student body president on a platform that included raising money for Korean war orphans. Um, he came in third in the election, but the school took up his cause anyway. Um, he applied for conscientious objector status during the Vietnam war. Um, and as far as I know, he is the only prominent politician I've ever heard say that. Um, or even say they considered it. His application was eventually turned down, by which point, thankfully, he was too old to be drafted. And uh, it's important that everybody contrast that with uh, President Trump 
getting a deferment for bone spurs or President Clinton, who famously went to Canada instead of risking uh, risking being uh, brought into the military in Vietnam. He has been um, active in the civil rights movement and the peace movement for the majority of his life. He attended uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech in 1963 on the, in Washington. Um, he fought against segregated campus housing during his time at the University of Chicago and Chicago uh, and in the Chicago public school system. Um, for those who are, are Bernie fans, if you have seen a photograph of him being arrested, um, that was him fighting against segregation in the Chicago school system. Um, his early political career was characterized by several long shot runs for statewide office under the banner of the left wing Liberty Union Party, which he also chaired for some time. Um, in the 1970s, Bernie ran for governor twice and Senate twice under the party's nomination, but he polled in the single digits in all four races. Um, during his 72 campaign, he actually told a group of high school students that the U.S. had committed acts in its war with Vietnam that were, quote, almost as bad as what Hitler did, which I think is a really profound thing to talk about. We're willing to talk about how bad World War II was, but not how bad other wars like Vietnam were. Um, hold on, I lost my spot. Uh, he said, the North Vietnamese are not my enemy. He told uh, class of ninth graders, there are very, very poor people. Some of them don't have shoes. They eat rice when they can get it. And they have been fighting for the freedom of their country for 25 years. Um, the Herald uh, had reported that students pushed back against Sanders' support for amnesty for draft evaders, saying it wouldn't be fair to the parents of soldiers killed in the fighting. In 76, he left the Liberty Union Party, uh, and it was a, about a very, a very significant uh, policy of theirs that they were generally only active during election season, which Bernie came down on them hard, saying that they needed to be active during all, at all the time that election season. It, it couldn't just wait for that time. The party that he used to belong to, the Liberty Union Party, in 2016 told Vice News that Sanders was, quote, never a socialist that you know that this party was specifically under the umbrella of socialism of changing the united states over to be a, a socialist country um and that since the party has officially branded sanders um as a war criminal like much of what what they might brand much of the rest of congress um as opposed to seeing that a little bit differently they lump bernie in with that so it's it's i think that's pretty profound um, after he was elected in Burlington, his city hall office was decorated with a poster of Eugene Debs, who a, a big hero of, of ours here on the podcast, who ran for president on the Socialist Party ticket in the nineteen hundred from the nineteen hundreds to the nineteen twenties. Um, I believe the same poster or plaque, whatever it is, has hung up, been hung up in his office in every office he has held up through the Senate. Um, he also made a short film strip on Eugene Debs prior to entering office as part of his work as the director of the American People's Historical Society in Burlington. And give me just a second here. I have a clip of that I want to play for you guys. In September 1918, when the court was about to sentence him to his jail sentence for opposing World War I, the 63-year-old Debs fixed his eyes upon the presiding judge and spoke his philosophy of life. Your Honor, years ago I recognized my kinship with all living things, and I made up my mind that I was not one bit better than the meanest on earth. I said then and I say now that while there is a lower class, I am in it. While there is a criminal element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. You know, that, I, I just got to say, Henry, I get the chills listening to Bernie read that. Um, I played that clip uh, for my students during the World War I class at West Point, uh, which I thought was a, uh, a very interesting place to play that. 
uh, at the military academy. And, uh, and of course, those of you following me on social media know that um, not only do I wear a shirt with that quote on it when I go to rallies, but uh, it, it's, you know, the background to all my uh, social media. So I'm just so glad you played that, Henry. No, I was, I was really thankful that I found it. I'm going to try to get permission to take the entire film strip because it's on YouTube and get it uploaded to our, our Fortress on a Hill channel so everybody can, can take a look at that. And um, he scripted the whole thing himself. He did read short portions of it, like that quote from Eugene Debs, but generally it was other people. Um, there was just one problem um, that while Bernie was mayor of Burlington, um, for the Vermont Educational Television wouldn't show it. Uh, the organization claimed its decision was made on quality grounds. Uh, Sanders viewed that as a cover for ideological objections. Um, in the, and in the face of that, um, Sanders and others uh, formed concerned citizens about Vermont Educational Television, uh, trying to pressure management to show more local content and have greater say over its programming. Um, before long, they did cave on the film. Um, more importantly, it formed a board made of community groups like farmers, feminists, artists, and the poor to make decisions about public television. Um, it, uh, however, there was one at one point, uh, Bernie wouldn't actually let it air when it was finally released because the workers for Vermont Educational Television were on strike. And he said that playing it at that point would be an insult to Deb's memory. But when the strike was over, the film was finally shown. So um, just to get a little more specific here with some of Bernie's views on foreign policy, um, he appreciates that for most people, the U.S.-led world or order has failed to deliver on its many promises. In various speeches, Sanders has highlighted the manifold crimes the United States committed so throughout the so-called American century, overthrowing Iran's Mohammad Mossadegh in 1953, contributing to the ouster of Chile's Salvador Allende in 1973, and supporting murderous regimes in El Salvador and Guatemala, just to name a few. Um, because Sanders actually acknowledges the villainous behavior of Americans during the era of so-called U.S. leadership, he is willing to forthrightly place limits on U.S. power. Um, in a statement he gave on Venezuela, he declared that the United States has had a long history of inappropriately intervening in Latin American countries and categorically asserts that we can't go down that road again. Um, in 1985, Bernie was the highest ranking U.S. official to visit Nicaragua at the time and met with President Ortega. Uh, in his book, he called the trip profoundly emotional and praised Ortega. Um, and that also led to Burlington, Vermont, and uh, Managua, Nicaragua becoming sister cities. Um, a few years later, in 88, uh, Bernie actually went on his honeymoon in the USSR before the collapse. Um, a, he, the trip was actually also part of an official de delegation from Burlington to cement the two sister cities relationship. Bernie says, quote, trust me, it was a very strange honeymoon. Um, he also visited in Cuba in 89 with his wife. He tried to meet uh, Castro, but it didn't work out. And ended up meeting with the mayor of Havana and other officials there. Um, at the, and at the time, Sanders mentioned how proud he was of Burlington's international diplomacy efforts. Quote, Burlington had a foreign policy because, as progressives, we understand that we all live in one world, end quote. Now, that doesn't mean that everything was always hunky-dory during his, his early, early time. There was a protest that happened at the gate of a, a General Electric factory that they have there in Burlington. And the peace activists were protesting because it was the one factory in the U.S. that um, actively made Gatling guns. So any Gatling gun on any vehicle or any other use was going to come from there. And peace activists obviously feel very strongly about all of that. Um, Sanders was upset with them for, quote, blaming the workers, end quote, and not focusing their, focusing their attention on the federal centers of strategic thinking on U.S. foreign policy. Um, Sanders accused the activists of pointing the finger of guilt at working people. 
He um, reportedly came around to opposing the sit-in after meeting with the workers' union leaders. Um, he said not everyone has the luxury to choose where they're going to work. Um, his position really flew in the face of increased local activism around war and peace issues, especially in Vermont, where at that time, 159 out of 100 towns had passed nuclear freeze resolutions. Um, and this, this wasn't part of my era, but I wanted to contrast this with another thing from Bertie's history, and it's about his statements in support for F-35s being stationed in, in uh, Vermont. Um, it's, a, it's a major contradiction in his opposition to out-of-control military spending. Um, and not only did he support the F-35, he pushed, despite local opposition, to get those fighter jets stationed at the Burlington Airport for the Vermont National Guard. So take that as you will. Um, moving forward a little bit to his time in the House and the Senate, he was steadfastly opposed the 2003 war in Iraq, but he did support the Iraq Liberation Act of 1998 under President Clinton, which declared that regime change in Iraq should be the official policy of the United States. So then we come to Bernie's overall voting record. Um, and this, this was an article done uh, by Medea Benjamin at Code Pink. Um, Secretary Standards is the best voting record of any can of war and peace issues, especially on military spending. Um, he's only voted for three out of 19 military spending bills since 2013. By this measure, no other candidate comes close, including Tulsi Gabbard. Um, in terms of stopping the war in Yemen, um, over the past uh, few years, himself, along with Senators Murphy and Lee, have led a sustained effort to shepherd uh, a war, a war powers resolution bill through on Yemen um, with Ro Khanna uh, supporting that in the House. Um, he supports U.S. withdrawals from Afghanistan and Syria and opposes U.S. threats of war against Venezuela. But his rhetoric on foreign policy sometimes demonizes foreign leaders in ways that unwittingly lend support to the regime change policies he opposes. As when, for example, he joined a chorus of U.S. politicians Label, labeling Gaddafi in Libya a quote-unquote thug and a murderer. And this was shortly before he was murdered by U.S.-backed thugs. Um, so the, the, the big question they brought up in this article about his voting is that which Sanders, which Bernie would we likely see in the White House? Would it be one who has the care, clarity and courage to vote no on 84% of the military spending bills or the one who supports military boondoggles like the F-35? and can't resist repeating inflammatory smears of progressive, progressive leaders. So that's all I have to say about that. I, I feel like we, we, thanks, that was great. Um, that was really good. I feel like uh, we have to thank a lot of his pushback. Um, well, I mean, he's, he's, he is one of those politicians who actually listens to people, right? And he's willing to consider other points as well as his own but he also you know has very strong beliefs on himself about interventionism so but like i mean uh the guy who's been heading his foreign policy this uh time around in this campaign matt dust he used to work for center for american progress which unfortunately has become a lot more um hawkish <laughs> lately. Uh, but anyways, he left that to start the Foundation for Native Peace. And that has been really focusing on the Israel-Palestine conflict and, you know, trying to push back against the APAC pro-Israel stance, like without considering the Palestinian perspective. So I think that's like, to me, that's one of the biggest things um, why he's been a lot more vocal. And I mean, let's listen to the last debate. He fucking, he said, he, like you mentioned, Henry, like he mentioned the Chile and Iran and the other, you know, he mentioned U.S. interventions in other countries on a presidential debate stage, which no other candidate in history has done, really, like, on a, at least in a major, a major presidential candidate. So, like, that's pretty amazing. And I think we have to give him props for that. Um so, I mean, but yeah, like we have to take their whole account into play, but I think the fact that he's got someone on his side that 
is really pushing for these progressive policies in foreign policy is great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, I can going to get more into this um, and talk about some of these things. Um, there are some problematic votes in his past, and then and then I'm going to sort of parry back with you know, you know, Chomsky, who's not known as a uh, a waffler uh, on principles, right? Uh, has been uh, on every interview of late. Every interview he gives, which is amazing at 90, just how clear sighted he is. He's been arguing for lesser of two evils, which is not something that you would expect Chomsky to argue for. But, you know, I, I think taking that, he, he says that because the human race is, is facing extinction, that now, to some extent, not like Joe Biden, lesser of two evils necessarily, but, you know, lesser of two evils or, or accepting an imperfect, impure, you know, candidate is a necessity when one party, uh, which includes not just the Republicans, but the DNC hawkish wing of the Democratic Party, when one party, you know, either denies climate change in the case of the Republicans or espouses dangerous up, up to and including nuclear uh, first strike policy, uh, which he sees as the two existential threats, right, climate change and, and nuclear annihilation, you know, I think what, what I'm going to argue later, uh, after we point out the very important flaws, right, in the Sanders uh, past, is that, you know, we really can't afford uh, to miss this opportunity because the human race may depend on it. And, and I think when you look at that record, um, it was profound, okay, in that he mentioned, you know, interventions in Central America and regime changes and CIA coups on the debate stage. I mean, that that's a topic that was literally beyond the pale until the other night. I mean, unheard of. You can't say that stuff in polite company, in polite two-party system company, uh, or you're a pariah. And I think that does demonstrate a lot of courage. The Cuba thing showed some courage. Um, we're going to get to that. But, you know, the easy answer would have just been to play nice um, and, and just, you know, say Castro's a monster and leave it at that or apologize for his comments. And I think he has shown courage, Debs like courage to some extent, Eugene Debs like courage. And, uh, you know, those 84% of the times that he voted against the military budget bill, that's risk. That's risk because the minute you vote against the military budget, you know what the Democrat establishment and of course the conservative uh, monolith is going to say they're going to say you're not supporting the troops and so yeah i mean that's a pretty principled stand and uh, henry i think you did a really good job of kind of bringing us up to date right bringing us up to 2016 what i like is the way you talked about his youth and his early career to show that this guy was not assembled like mayor pete haha was not assembled in a dnc lab you know he is a, a man with a past uh, an imperfect one, but a, a definitely a principled, idealistic one. And I, I like that about Bernie, that, that he strikes me as authentic for the most part. And, of course, I'm showing my colors, and I'll get to more of this later. But, yeah, great, great job, Henry. That was really awesome. And I learned something from listening to you, and I know our listeners are, because they have real lives and don't have their noses in a book as often as I do. <laughs> no, uh... Bernie, uh, it's it's very clear from going through his history to see how he ended up where he wanted to go, and you know his his divergence with the Liberty Union Party back in the day. It wasn't about you know it wasn't about principles. It was about trying to get things done. And he his choice to be an independent for most of his career allowed him to stay away from the fray in in a lot of ways. But it also meant that he wasn't getting, you know, people weren't constantly banging on him about what they're supposed to do. You know, like you mentioned, Danny, about what happened in Central America, and that you can't mention it as in polite company. That, you know, somebody like Mayor Pete, who just spouts, you know, what the, what the military industrial complex tells him to spout. But that doesn't happen with Bernie, and you can clearly see that all the way back to his youth, that the victims of war both American victims of war and foreign victims of war are something that he's cared about for a very long time. Absolutely. 
Oh, shall we move on to his missteps? Yeah. So um, the big things for me that I was pointing out, mostly over the last, you know, since he became a congressman um, in 1990, I was, you know, he was against the Iraq War and the first Gulf War, but he did end up supporting the no-fly zone that we put in place, which was arguably also pretty damaging, as well as the sanctions. And, you know, he's been a fan of sanctions as far as, like, in proposed, in opposed to, um, like, mass troop mobilizations. But as we know, economic sanctions often end up hurting the, pe the working people and the poorer people more than it hurts the government. And with the idea that, somehow if we place enough sanctions on people they'll get angry enough to like overthrow their government and that normally doesn't happen you just see governments clamp down and try to maintain their power as long as possible while the people suffer so as far as a progressive policy you could say that supporting uh no fly zones and sanctions are not good but um yeah i, I mean it's important to it's important to bring out those points, as well as the, <clears throat> he supported the bombing of Kosovo in 99, and Henry, as you mentioned, that uh, signing that document in 98, saying that the overthrow of regime change, that was a problem. Supporting the F-35, also a problem. Um, and he also, in the spirit of cooperation, as much as he does like to want to get international and regional partners involved whenever there's a conflict. He did, you know, support the Saudis and the Gulf countries to get more involved in fighting ISIS. And, you know, like Saudi Arabia is that elephant in the room a lot when we're talking about Middle East politics. And, you know, we it's this giant thing that we have to contend with. But uh you know, there there are other better ways that we can approach it. And I think his positions have evolved over this time, but it's important to bring this stuff up. And, you know, I, I liked, Henry, that you brought up the thing about protesting the uh, General Electric or the, the factory that made the guns, because it's like we have to, we have to acknowledge that, like, manufacturing in this country is terrible, but the one the one part of the manufacturing you know industry that is alive and well is the defense contractors and making the weapons and so he has to balance that you know anybody has to balance that the the like what my constituents need as far as work and jobs and skills that they can use with the greater mission of like you know those things that are good for those people end up helping this giant military industrial complex, which is not good for people. So I, which that kind of leads me to my bigger point about just the harder thing when it comes to neoliberalism, you know, is that we look at growth as, we, we, we tend to look at growth only when it, when it relates to GDP, right? And a lot of the podcasts that I've been listening to about economics, you know, are trying to find they're looking at these other ways that we can promote growth without just calling it GDP, like with looking at the economic indicators of people's lives and how well people are doing and how you know healthy are they. And there's other ways that we can be doing this, but it's hard when neoliberalism often wants to say that we as people are perfectly selfish and we're perfectly rational. You know, even though you look at any social science, any you know, psychology, neurobiology, even economics itself is starting to realize that that's absolute bullshit. But we still have to push back against that. And it's hard when there's all these counter narratives about what we as progressives, you know, are thinking, at least for me, it's, you know, being collaborative, working together, looking as far as foreign policy goes, looking towards di diplomatic solutions before we use force. And, and if force is necessary, like not having America be the spearhead to try to get what it wants, but allowing people who are in the region who actually will be most affected by it to be the, the leaders, 
And I think that, you know, that he, he has the most comprehensive policy when it comes to that. And so that's why I'm so, I support him more than any other candidate is because he's really pushing for those structural changes in our society that continue to make things harder for regular working class people. It's not that, you know, he's perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it's like, he's the best person we have now. And we have to, like you said, Danny, when it comes to, you know, we have to accept imperfect people sometimes. And like, he is definitely the best option we have, but it's like, we need people who are gonna be able to get together and make things work, even if their ideologies aren't, you know, entirely the same. But the thing that I, I get really pissed off when I hear people think that he's so radical because everything that he's proposing is stuff that like FDR proposed and it's stuff that the Germans and the French take for granted. You know, it's, it's like most industrialized countries have these things and we should have them too. So there's nothing radical about any of this stuff. It's just, it's so radical because our framework ideologically has been pulled so far to the right. You know, we, we think of anything that's like benefiting the majority of people as somehow radical, but I find that really annoying. <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's the big thing is like, I, if we, as far as foreign policy goes and the defense contractors, I think if we were able to have somebody, you know, who's willing to push back against them and say, oh, you know, we don't need, we don't need all this stuff we can do with less. And he's going to have a lot of problems going up against that, but it's like, we have to push for somebody who's willing to say those things and then actually move forward on them. You know, I, I do think that it's important to point out the imperfections and some of the contradictions in the Bernie in Bernie's career, um, because you know, as I was joking before we started recording, um, and if, listeners, we are going to start recording the banter a little more uh, and re probably start releasing it as bonus material. Um, as long as, uh, as long as you guys don't share it and get me more hate mail. Um, <laughs> and I don't want to, I don't want to upset my handler, Vladimir Putin, uh, too much. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I've started to just lean into that. I've started to just lean into the Putin apologist, Putin asset, uh, jibes that I get, but you know, look in all seriousness, look at us, look at our pictures, right? Uh, we are, we are males, right? Um, we are open and we're, and we're open Bernie supporters and, and we're veterans, which means that we're washed up frat boys in the eyes of a lot of people. At least that's how I dress. But, um, we do stand always to be painted with the very pejorative and I think very dangerous Bernie bro brush, yes. right? Uh, whatever that means. And, and I think it's come to mean something rather ad, ad hominem, right? So that that phrase it's not meant as a compliment, right? Um, and, and so I think that in order to, to show some level of, you know, nuance and that we've thought through these things and that we're not just cheerleaders, we have to point some of these things out. And, and I will say that, you know, while the F-35 is problematic, while, while some of the um, rhetoric around Gaddafi, not that he was a good guy, but some of the rhetoric around these dictators is dangerous and maybe sets the stage for some of what follows, um, I do think that the most uh, awful thing, oh, hold on one second, guys, you have to edit this, sorry. The guys and I love doing the podcast, being able to share our experiences in the military with allies and supporters means the world to us, but we can't do all the work. We need you to share an episode of ours with somebody anyone whom you think might be affected by it. Maybe a young person looking to join the military or parents advocating for one, uh, conscientious citizens who care about the violence the U.S. wages in their name, advocates for women and people of color who understand the harsh environment the military can create for minorities and also inflicts on minorities across the globe. 
and anyone else you think it might affect, please take a minute and share this with them. Now, our podcast is supported in a few different ways. First, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping the guys and I pay for some of the podcast's expenses. Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help us keep going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and other crap I can't think of right now. So let's bring out these honorary producers, and they are Will Lorenz, Gage Counts, Fahim Shirazi, Henry Zamoda, James O'Barr, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you very much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt. The great Bill Kropinski did an awesome job designing our first shirt, which you can find at shop.spreadshirt.com forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Check for promo codes before you order. And now, let's get back to the podcast. My ba- my bad. I, uh, I I messed up and had a uh, call come in that I didn't. Anyway, never mind. So let me back up, uh, take a quick pause, and say the thing that you mentioned, Gagan, okay, that most bothers me in his record is the 1998 Iraq Liberation Act because that document, that bill, was so nefarious. And turned out to be so dangerous. It, it it really did set the stage for the 2003 Iraq invasion. I mean, I can't think of many times in any nation's history where they first passed a bill that declared another regime an enemy that needed to be taken down. And then within five years passed a new bill, an authorization for the use of military force in this case, that actually went ahead. I mean, we laid our cards on the table. We laid our cards on the table. This was, you know, this was literally our playbook that we handed to the world. We said, U.S. policy is to change the regime in Iraq, and then we did it. And it it really, I don't believe the 9-11 truth stuff. And uh, that gets me a lot of hate on my alt left uh, comment boards, and that's okay. I understand their concerns and I understand their doubts, or at least I understand why they have a proclivity for those doubts. And I think that part of it is, is, is it's twofold. First, you have this 1998 Iraq Liberation Bill. Look, when a country spells out that it wants to get rid of a dude by force if necessary, and then does it, that leads people to start to believe that the country or the government of the United States was just looking for an excuse. And 9-11, of course, did in fact provide the justification uh, for that invasion. So I think what happens is some people looking for reason, looking for uh, a way to understand the world, right? They, they, they connect those two, right? And then they say, see, 9-11 must have been an inside job, right? But that's why it happened. And then the other one, which Bernie wasn't a part of, and he's been a big critic of, is this um, project for the New American Century um, think tank document where they laid out, uh, it, it, they said as much that they were, it would take a new Pearl Harbor-like event in order to do all the things we want to do, specifically uh, overturn the regime in Iraq and then also spread you know, freedom, quote-unquote, in the Middle East and just have a more assertive military policy. You know, that memo plus the 98 Iraq Liberation Act gave a lot of fodder, right? Gave gave a lot of um, energy and catalyzed the 9-11 truther movement. And I understand why, actually, even if I don't subscribe to it. 
Um, this is dangerous stuff. And oh, by the way, that PNAC, me PNAC memo uh, was either signed by or uh, supported by uh, members of the board of PNAC, which included folks like Rumsfeld, Cheney, Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl, right? The whole Bush team, right? The whole yeah. island of misfit yep. neocon toys, um, <laughs> which, which, by the way, we really do need to like create some sort of Guantanamo for misfit neocons. Like they shouldn't be allowed on MSNBC. They shouldn't be allowed on MSNBC. They should wear like orange jumpsuits and like be sent. I mean, not to prison. They can like drink like martinis made of gold or whatever they're into. But they should definitely be sent away. But no, I think this was a really bad vote by Bernie. I think he got caught up in the times. I'm not making an excuse. I think this is. A, I don't think it's a positive that he got caught up in the times. Um, there was this post Cold War triumphalism uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and after our miraculous. The military victory or seemingly miraculous military victory in the Gulf War, first Gulf War, 1990 to 91. Um, it was really easy to believe that America could reshape the world. And I do think Bernie probably got caught up in that. And I also think there were probably some political calculations made by him. And that, 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 that worries me and I'm not happy about it. But uh, so, yeah, I think that's the most important thing that you brought up. The other stuff is, is valid and important as well. But um this guy does not have a perfect record. And, and, you know, um, right after this, I'm going to kind of make my argument, right. I'm going to, I'm going to lay out my argument for why Bernie, um, from the pool that's available. And, uh, yeah. So depending on anything else you guys have said, have to say, I'm going to jump in. Oh, uh, I had, I had one thought, um, one note that I really wanted to hammer on a little bit. And that was about that Bernie voted for the Afghan war. Um, which was, you know, like you're mentioning, Danny, it was very much a, a sign of the times, you know, post 9-11. It was only a few months after 9-11 at that time. But as we've talked about many times on the podcast, the 2001 AUMF is really problematic for a lot of different reasons. And also, it I think that it, it somewhat highlights Bernie had. I feel like Bernie has more of a weak spot when it comes to uh, counterterrorism policies and drone policies um, that, you know, it's, it's something that we're going to have to see, at, you know, if, if, if he wins, what becomes of that. But I feel like that was a, a very big blind spot. And Danny, you've talked about it many times, how Afghanistan, according to Barack Obama, was the good war and Iraq was the bad war. Um, but anyway, I'll let you I'll let you get started. Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought up that vote. Um, Barbara Lee was the only Congress person, Congresswoman, to oppose the uh, Afghan war, AUMF. You know, I've brought this up a million times, and I, I, I will never stop bringing it up. Question, is it a prudent time to declare an open-ended war? Because that's what the AUMF was. It was the most vague declaration of war in, in maybe human history. It's, it, it, its language was vague, and the way it's been used has been even more sort of vague and all-encompassing. Uh, we, we, we are fighting groups today, groups in countries today, that did not exist on September 11, 2001. That's how broad this AUMF was that Bernie voted for. The thing was so broad that it was prescriptive and prophetic. It, it encompassed future enemies, right? Which is not what sanctioning war is. I'm sorry, guys. Um, it's not what sanctioning war is supposed to be about. It's not what it's supposed to be about. Um, Barbara Lee voted against it. She was like literally shaking, she has said, when she gave her like one minute, 30 second spiel uh, about why she was voting against it. I honestly profoundly recommend that every single reader take a minute 30 out of their life, Google Barbara Lee, vote against the AUMF and listen to her comments. They are so prescient. Um, it's, it's, it's disturbing to see how nervous she is up there because she's taking a principled stand at a time where that was a dangerous thing to do politically. But honestly, in post 9-11 America, where, you know, Muslims were getting beat up, um, it was also probably physically dangerous for her safety. Um, Bernie voted for it. It was it was terrible. My question is, is it a prudent time to vote for an open ended war to sanction an open ended war three days after the, the worst attack 
uh, on American domestic soil in history when literally Ground Zero was still smoking, was still smoking. Okay, my uncles were there digging for their friends, and it was still smoking. It was still smoking uh, to some extent weeks later. This is not the time to make rational decisions, and I think Bernie got caught up in that as well. Let me pivot now to Bernie versus the rest. Um, I w work on a volunteer basis for the Sanders campaign. I did a phone bank just the other night on um, – Thursday night here in Lawrence, but I was calling folks in Super Tuesday states, mostly Massachusetts and California. If you've ever, for your sins, volunteered for a campaign, you know that phone banking is goddamn brutal. I mean, you got to have a thick skin, not quite as thick as canvassing, because then you got to actually look motherfuckers in the eye. But it's tough to get hung up on over and over again. It's tough to get yelled at. You know, you make 10 calls, maybe you get to actually talk to somebody who's willing to talk to you for, you know, one out of 10, if you're lucky. You know, I kept notes on all my calls because I want to write an article about it. But yeah, so I'm a Bernie guy, right? I'm a Bernie guy. I refuse to use the word Bernie bro anymore, right? Unless we take it back. We should take it back. You know, we should like, we should own it, right? Um, I don't want to compare it per se to what the African-American community has done because that is far more profound, but we should take it back. Um, but, I, you know, I'm a Bernie guy. And I think that when you look at his record on foreign policy, because that's my expertise, that's our expertise, that's what this pod is. Um, I support his domestic policies for the most part, but I support Bernie on foreign policy. That's the main reason I support him. And that's interesting to some people because to be fair, unlike Tulsi, Bernie does not front load his foreign policy in the debates. No. Now, when he gets when he gets the rare question from the DNC hacks over at MSNBC or CNN who run the debates, he does give good answers. But it's not the it's not the spearhead. It's not the centerpiece of his campaign. Right. Billionaires, oligarchy. That's been his thing. Right. He's kind of like, as Basevich said in his recent book, he's kind of the Henry Henry Wallace of, of 2020. Right. Henry Wallace was, of course, the very progressive former vice president on the FDR. But here's why foreign policy informs my vote and my support and my work for Bernie. It's because for better or worse, and decidedly, I think it's worse. The area where an American president has the most influence unilaterally to, to turn the ship of state, okay, is on foreign policy. Yeah. Because on domestic policy, you got to go through Congress. Right, because most domestic policy involves money in the uh, federal budget, and for the most part, Congress controls the purse strings. Okay, they've ceded that on foreign policy, and now they just vote almost all of them just rubber stamp anything put in front of them, no matter how much of a giveaway it is for the gun runners, which is what I'm going to start calling the defense industry. I, I, I like plain language, like George Carlin. So I'm over defense contractor. That's lifeless language. Gun runners, folks. Gun runners. That's what they are. Um, so anyway, because they have to go to Congress, the presidents, any president, let's be real. I'm hoping that Bernie is able to catalyze a mass movement. I'm hoping that there is some sort of small R revolution surrounding Bernie on the domestic front. But I'm also a realist and a cynic. And I know most likely Bernie's best ideas, right? The best laid plans of mice and Bernie are going to die in Congress. They're going to die in Congress. There's too many Republicans and there's too many neoliberal Democrats, period. I'm not certain Bernie can accomplish everything he wants to accomplish domestically, but while he will receive massive pushback from the defense lobbyists, from the Pentagon, which is supposed to be apolitical, right? Um, he can do a lot of profound things on foreign policy because the second part of the reason that foreign policy matters is of late, especially since World War II, and more particularly since the end of Vietnam, presidents act as emperors in foreign policy, unilateral autocrats on foreign policy. Congress 
is derelict in their duty and has been for decades, more than half a century. We don't declare war anymore. Sometimes we do AUMFs if we feel like being polite, but a lot of times we don't even do that because 75 to 80 percent of the countries that have an OCO, o Overseas Contingency Operation, which is just Pentagon ease for uh, temporary deployment that involves some version of combat or combat advising, 75 to 80 percent by a conservative estimate of those have not been specifically sanctioned by an AUMF or at all by Congress. So presidents have almost complete latitude when it comes to foreign policy. And that is why I think Bernie has the potential to do really, really, really profound things. And that's why I'm going to front load foreign policy as I talk about him. Lesser of two evils is a, is a dangerous game because lesser of two evils got us Bill Clinton, um, less nefariously, but still problematically, it got us Obama. And it lost us the 2016 election by putting Hillary Warhawk Clinton up as the candidate for the Democratic Party. So lesser of two evils ideology or philosophy is dangerous. But along with Chomsky, I think that we cannot put Bernie to a purity test, especially on foreign policy. He is so far superior, so far superior to anybody else on the stage at this point, Tulsi being an exception, who has been blacked out by the media. Some people will say, well, that's because she doesn't have enough support. I would, uh, I would tell you that the evidence demonstrates that she was blacked out long before it was clear that she didn't have enough support. So we're, I think what we're doing is we're confusing causation and co correlation here. Look at Bernie compared to everybody else on that stage on foreign policy. Let's just do a quick review of who's still in the race in a meaningful way. Bloomberg, billionaire Bloomberg, still won't apologize for his support and cheerleading for the Iraq war. Recently, he still said he would support the Iraq war if he could go back. Outside of that, it's not clear if Bloomberg has much of a foreign policy, really. Which takes us to Amy Klobuchar. She says some of the right things about regime change wars. She says some of the right things about removing troops from Afghanistan. But she's a hedger. She's a mainstream hedger. When she's not yelling at her staff, she's hedging. Ha ha ha. She's reportedly yelling at her staff. She's hedging. And what she hedges on is she says, well, I'm going to pull, like a lot of them say, I'm going to pull the combat troops out of the Middle East. Oh, the combat troops. Well, what she means is she's going to keep other troops there. Of course, as we all know, language is a funny thing. And it's really easy to stress the English language and redefine again and again just what constitutes a combat soldier. <laughs> and in the Obama years, he liked to play with what just constitutes, what even constitutes a boot on the ground. <laughs> yeah. well, everyone, I mean, literally, I was like, well, wait, does the color of the boot matter? Uh, it, it doesn't matter which company makes it. Are they Rockies? I mean, it, this, this, this has been twisted, right? This has been twisted. That's what frustrated me and, so <laughs> much, like, during his first term, you know, and it's like, he'd say, oh, we don't have boots in the ground. I'm like, well, then who the fuck am I talking to that's sitting in this country right now? Like, what the fuck? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then, of course, he really toyed with that. And, and Marty Dempsey, who I think was, a, was, as far as they go, a really good chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Um, partly I'm biased because he uh, sings Irish songs uh, on top of tables at parties and taught English at West Point, English literature. So admittedly, I'm biased. But, you know, Marty Dempsey actually criticized this a lot when he was Joint Chiefs and, and a little bit after he left the way that Obama like toyed with the language of combat troops, you know, because as we know, you know, truck drivers die in ID strikes. And just because you call a green beret an advisor doesn't mean he's not a lethal weapon combat soldier. Right. 
So this is all useless. But Amy Klobuchar is not willing to say that she'll pull all the troops out of Afghanistan, that she'll pull all the troops out of the Middle East forthright. What also worries me about old Amy is that she's probably the best friend of Israel on that stage, um, Israel's right-wing government. Okay, This is not against Israel. I believe in the survival and security of Israel. I, I, I'm sorry I even have to say that. I wish I didn't just say that. I shouldn't have to. But she is an APAC favorite. She's a regular, right? She's a regular at APAC events. She's like a, she's like a Springsteen groupie for APAC. She's always there, and she always says the right thing. Um, I am deeply disturbed by her position on Palestine. Okay, that takes us to uh, Wall Street Pete, right, or uh, CIA Pete. I don't know. I'm not sure what I think about the whole CIA thing. I think maybe some of it is a misreading of his unit, but whatever. I don't like Pete. Pete was actually assembled in a DNC lab. Um, I've seen the footage. It was very Frankenstein's monster. It was, it was very interesting. Um, I'm kidding, but Pete is a DNC hack, and and I and I think a plant to some extent. I mean, not to be too conspiratorial, but like when they thought he might be the best alternative, although now I think Biden will take that role after South Carolina, which just happened yesterday. But um, you know, or just happened, yeah, just happened yesterday. Um, he peddles his military service a few months, largely spent as a driver, as a naval reservist in Afghanistan as somehow qualifying him for the highest office in the land. Uh, I don't believe, by the way, that you have to have had long-term military service in order to be a good commander-in-chief. Um, I don't think that that's necessary, and I don't even necessarily think that that's a, uh, always a positive. But I'm uncomfortable with the way he uses his limited military experience as his qualifier, um, which I think is an, an insecurity about his small town mayorship, right? Or small city mayorship. Because, you know, they said Obama was unqualified because he was only a senator for four years. And he was a, a you know, a, like a state representative or state senator before that. And he was a evil socialist uh, community organizer before that. Um, of course, Jesus was a community organizer, but nevertheless. So that, that was used against him. That was used against him. And I mean, Pete's record or qualification on paper is much worse than Obama's, right? So he, he uses his military service. And that, I don't like that. I, I don't like the way he uses it. Some people might say that I use my military service to further a career. And, and to some extent, I do use that as a platform. Um, but, I, but I also think that um, I, I hope that I take it beyond just the experiential and, and try to ground it in, in philosophy. I don't think Pete's done a great job of that. Uh, Pete also has hedged on combat troops coming out. Um, he's hedged on Afghanistan. He's hedged across the board on the Middle East, and, and he's shown himself to be a venal politician in a lot of his attacks on Sanders, especially regarding Cuba, when, of course, Bernie correctly identified that the education system and the health care system uh, vastly improved under Castro's government. So that's Pete. Then there's really the only guy that matters that's left is Uncle Joe. And Uncle Joe, uh, Scranton's own, is the most problematic, I would argue, on foreign policy. Because Joe has the most significant record on this, more so even than Bernie Sanders. He's been a senator since he was in his early 30s. He uh, has voted wrong. He has voted wrong or has been on the wrong side of history at almost every single turn, at almost every single pivotal foreign policy decision or vote of the last 50 odd years that he has been in the Senate or uh, either a senator or a presidential campaign, you know, uh, administration, vice president, et cetera. He's been wrong about everything, guys, everything, even more than Hillary, because Hillary didn't jump into the Senate till what, like, you know, 2000. Yeah. His record, is, his record is appalling. His Iraq vote, the way he misrepresents his position on the Iraq War of 2003 ought to be disqualifying. If the Democratic Party had a soul or a principle at all, he would be disqualified. 
in the eyes of Democrats and in the eyes of the establishment of the party, because he is a liar, or at least a serious obfuscator. He says that he voted for the Iraq war thinking that Bush would only invade if they sent, you know, the uh, weapons inspectors in again and maybe got some UN support. Of course, that is not at all how the AUMF read. Joe was the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for ever, okay? And at that point, he knew exactly what that bill said. He knew exactly what it said. So first of all, that's a lie. Second of all, he likes to say that he was the first person to turn, one of the first people to turn against it and lead the opposition to that war. Okay, Joe did come around. And actually, Joe said some reasonable things about how Iraq was inevitably going to divide into its three constituent ethnic religious parts. He did say that. And by late 04, he's a leading voice about that. But what about 03? So the insurgency kicks off hardcore in the summer of 03, mostly the Sunni insurgency at that point, because it's former Ba'athists and some Islamists. It is clear by then, and it is certainly clear by late 2003, that there are no weapons of mass destruction. It is also clear by that point that there was no relationship between Saddam Hussein and his sworn enemy, Al-Qaeda Islamists. Okay? And yet, for months, several months after the invasion, and for some months even after the insurgency kicks off in full gear, Joe is not only not leading the opposition against the Iraq war, Joe is a cheerleader for the Bush team. I should have really had the video ready to play. But there has been a documentary made with um, Danny Glover uh, uh, narrating and Matt Ho, my friend from Veterans for Peace and a million other organizations, former uh, Marine and whistleblower of the Afghan war. He's featured uh, widely in the documentary. It shows throughout the short documentary that Joe was a cheerleader for the war. I mean, he said the following, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's pretty close. At one point he said, look, guys, to his fellow Democrats on the floor, I know there are some of you out there who are like against this war now. You know, we haven't found any WMDs and there's an insurgency starting, but I support our president. I continue to support this war. We're better off in a world without Saddam. And here's the instructive part, guys. He says, this is a very popular president. President Bush is very popular, and he was at the time. And I want to support him. Now, that's an odd thing to say. Right? If you're, if you're, if you're you know, straight talk, express, Amtrak, principled Joe, right? If you're that, like you say you are. Why would you mention the president's popularity polling on the floor when defending your support for him? Very odd, isn't it? But also very characteristic. It tells us who Joe Biden is. Joe Biden is an insider's insider. Joe Biden rides the crocodiles in the swamp. That's who he is. And he's been wrong about everything. Okay? He has taken some stands that we're we're correct eventually but he's almost always a latecomer to the game he's never in the vanguard and he's not going to be in the vanguard in the goddamn oval office he ain't which brings us to bernie we talked about his record and i'm not going to rehash it even though every iota of danny wants to rehash everything because he loves his voice but bernie's record makes all those other candidates combined look stupid look ridiculous, look foolish. All the positives of the other candidates combined don't add up to one-tenth of the positive of Bernie on foreign policy. And, and I should back up and mention Liz Warren. Liz Warren uh, is not going to win, um, it looks like. And she's impressed me at times on foreign policy. I, I, I've liked Liz, it should be said, for a long time. Um, this may help explain why I don't have a girlfriend, but one of the things I like to do, uh, and have liked to do for years when I need 
a little warming of the soul is to binge watch Liz Warren, binge, binge watch Liz Warren videos uh, attacking Wall Street bankers. One of my favorite things to do. So I like Liz. Uh, she's a little weak on foreign policy. She definitely doesn't front load it. She's definitely more tepid than old Bernie. But she has given a couple, specifically one in particular, solid speech on foreign policy. Um, she says a lot of the right things. I think she's better than the others besides Bernie. But she's waffled a bit on the combat troops thing. Uh, I don't trust her on foreign policy the way I trust Bernie. Um, Liz is probably the only other one I'll vote for. Full disclosure, I think. If it's not Bernie, I mean. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm going to do. The, uh, the, she, uh, she, she has weaknesses on foreign policy. She's better than the others. But if you combine her, throw her in the pool with crocodile riding Biden, and, you know, um, I was a naval reserve officer, mayor, and now I know everything about foreign policy, Buttigieg. And, and, and even if you combine them all, their positives don't add up to a tenth of Bernie's. Bernie has shown courage on foreign policy on issues that did not further his career. What I mean is there is no – there are no political points to be gained. None. All risk, no reward. Let me say that again all risk, no reward to say anything positive about Cuba, to mention the fact that the U.S. through the CIA and other organizations has um, overthrown regimes throughout Central America and, and, of course, the world. There is no political gain in taking the side or at least uh, for, of the Sandinistas or at least criticizing the Contras and, and the U.S.-backed thugs and murder squads that we backed. Whether as mayor of Burlington, a congressperson, or a senator, time and again, Bernie has taken stands on foreign policy publicly that are going to be used against him, folks, publicly that you can find on YouTube, that you can find in the congressional record if you're a dork like me. Um, he's taken stands that had no okay, that were all risk and no reward. Why did he do it? I think that for all his flaws, because Bernie is human, he's human, for all his flaws, the guy obviously, through every step of his career, really of his life, I think it's better to say his life, the way he lives his life, right, has taken stands that were based on principles, stands that were based on love of humanity, no matter the color of their skin, the religion they espouse, or the borders the artificial borders man-made within which they reside. Think about that. What did it gain Bernie Sanders to support the regime in Nicaragua against American-backed death squad, who we funded with drug money? What did it gain him? He didn't need to go to the left of anybody in Vermont. Vermont, safest seat possible. Right. I mean, he didn't need to oppose American neo-imperialism in, in, in Latin America in order to stay mayor of Burlington. He didn't need to do that to stay congressperson. Even in Vermont, it was more risk than reward. And, yeah, I recognize I do. I'm not stupid. Like, I recognize that Bernie got away with a lot because he represents Vermont. But I still don't think that takes away from the fact that the man has shown that he will take political risks for the love of humanity. And that's why, and I'm going to end with this, actually, for once. I'm going to end on this so we can talk about other stuff, but or stay within our timeline for once. I'm going to end with this. Bernie was the perfect guy to read Eugene Debs' statement before the court, before he was sentenced to federal prison for 10 years. He said that he recognizes that he's no better than the meanest of the earth that he has a kinship with all people and that so long as there is a lower class, he's in it. And so long as there is a criminal element, he is of it. And so long as there is a soul in prison, he's not goddamn free. I'm ending with that because who better than a man who's taken political risks time and again, imperfect, but political risks time and again, that did not benefit him for the, the downtrodden of this world. 
He said that even though he was a mayor of a small city in a small state, that he had a position on foreign policy. Because as a progressive, a true progressive, true goddamn progressive, he recognizes that the the issues of the people of the world are, are the issues of all of us. And that's that kinship with his fellow man that Debs talked about. And I know, I know in my heart, affected Bernie because he was making documentaries about it before it mattered, when it wasn't cool, when it didn't benefit him with his left wing base. So you show me a democratic field in a time of climate extinction, in a time where the doomsday clock is closer to midnight, as put there by the bulletin of atomic scientists, you know, smart guys, about nuclear war. You show me a time when the human race is a greater threat to extinction, arguably, than ever before. And then you show me the candidates that the DNC is spewing up or the billionaire class is spewing up. And then you show me a Bernie Sanders. And God damn it, I'll give American democracy I'll give the system one more try. And that's my plea for Bernie, guys. I love what you said about, you know, like people often ask me why I care so much about foreign policy. And I say exactly what you said about that the president has more power, especially since 9-11. Like they have more power to do anything unilaterally when it comes to foreign policy than anything else. And, And beyond just that, it's like, If we want to have the domestic policies that are going to affect the majority of people and what I consider to be true centrism, like Jesse Jackson talks about the moral center, you know, and so he says, like, Medicare for all, uh, it's like ending student debt, like those are morally centered things to do because it's what's going to benefit the most people, not ideologically what's in the center, because honestly, the parties, the establishment, they only care about the rich people because that's who they get their money from. So if you want to talk about moral centrism, you know, you're talking about these domestic policies that the progressives are pushing. The only way we're going to get do that, get that done is by pushing back against this giant beast of the military industrial complex. And so we have to confront foreign policy before we confront domestic policy. I mean, we can do them simultaneously, but honestly, like the only way we're going to, you know, everyone keeps asking him, how are we going to pay for it? We're going to pay for it by ending these stupid programs like the F-35 and building, you know, brand new carriers and destroyers that don't even fucking work and spending all this money. Like the fact that the floor for the defense budget never goes down, like we need to address that. Like, how much money do people actually need? You know, and we have to start talking about it from that perspective because that's going to make all of those other domestic policies so much easier. And, I mean, that, yeah, that's that's where I come from. The biggest concern I have left about Bernie um, is something that is very widely known now about Barack Obama is that in his run up to being elected, he talked about a lot of anti-war topics. Um, now Bernie is a, in, in my opinion, a much more uh, genuine leader than Obama was, especially going over the history that we've just discussed. However, people need to know that when Bernie does get in the white house, there's going to be shifts. There's going to be situations maybe out of his control, some things that he can't control. But the, my point is that we're going to keep watching despite, and I feel comfortable speaking for the three of us on this, that despite us really wanting Bernie to become president of the United States, we're going to critique him. We're going to critique everything that he does, everything that he says about foreign policy, and we're going to hold his feet to the fire. Um, you know, he talks about not me, us. That is, is, is about that. And there may come a day that Bernie is no longer the prominent progressive, whether if he passes away as he is an old, older fellow or other people come up in the party like AOC or other leaders of, of that. I just want to point out that 
this will be a continuing process for us and to anybody listening, let it be a continuing process for you. Don't, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to put things down on January 20th of 2021 when the, the executive branch changes in a, in a ginormous fashion. Um, and we need to, and we need to remind everybody to do that for themselves. Yeah. You, you bet your ass you will. Um, we are not, and you, you are absolutely right to speak for us. Um, cause I, I know that we're on the same page on this as we talk about it all the time, but like we on force on a hill, we are three guys who are not going to play the Obama right or wrong card, you know, that so many mainstream liberals did where he got a pass, right? Mm -hmm. He got a pass on drones, on the war in the press, on Libya, because every time he did something wrong, the liberals said one of two things. They said, well, he's our guy. Or they said, you know, he's our guy right or wrong, my country right or wrong. Or they said, what they say? They said, oh, oh, the alternative would be so much worse. Uh, you can't criticize Obama because then you're going to get a Romney. Um, and of course, what you ended up getting was a Trump. <laughs> but I mean, no, we're not going to do that. No way. Bernie's feet need to be held to the fire like any other executive because they serve ostensibly. They should serve at our pleasure, right? They Civil serve service. us. It is not the other way around. They serve us. And, and, and Bernie is going to have to be held to the fire especially on foreign policy, because as we mentioned, Kagan and I in particular, that is where he's going to have the most power and latitude. And so, look, if he, if he waffles, if he goes back on it, if he makes political calculations uh, that, that, are, that are against the principles that we espouse or against the good of humanity and our own strategic you know, safety and ethics, I, I'll tell you where you're going to find me. You're going to find me on the street with a megaphone, boring the shit out of everybody. Whether, <laughs> Bernie's whether Bernie's president or Trump's president, that's where we belong because this is the long game, man. This is the long game. This isn't about winning the 2020 election. Mm -hmm. Winning the election is like, God, that's barely the starting gate for the troubles ahead of us, right? Yeah. So, yeah, we're, we're going to hold the feet to the fire. Thanks for saying that, Henry, man. I wish I would have thought of that. That's so important. If that is what scares me, I mean, honestly, like, say he becomes president, a situation happens, he goes into the, you know, he meets with the NSC, you know, and like, I fucking hope whoever he chooses as SecDef or whoever he chooses as his national security advisor, I hope that they align with his principles of, you know, diplomacy before force and uh, cooperation, you know, I hope that, that that he picks, and I'm sure he will do his best to do that. But I mean, <laughs> when it comes down to it, a situation happens and he gets in that room and then there's people being like, we need to do X, Y, and Z right now. You know, like, we don't know what's going to go through his head in those moments, like what he's going to do. All we can do is that he hopes, we hope that he falls back on these principles that he's followed his whole life. And the optimist in me would love to see that that is the case, but it is like, it is a big, big hurdle to overcome for just one person or one administration. So yeah, like you said, Danny, this is a long game and we just have to keep pushing through it. And yeah, we're always going to be on that side of things. A quick note, uh, a quick note is that, um, I don't know if you've seen any of the articles, but, um, there's this article about, uh, I forget which what website it's on, pretty, pretty mainstream. Uh, it said, what would a, I think the title, something like, what would a Bernie Sanders um, cabinet look like? Like a potential Bernie Sanders, like presidential candidate uh, a cabinet look like? And shortlisted, actually top of the shortlist, I don't know if I believe it, is Andy Bacevich, our Secretary of Defense. Oh, fuck uh, yeah. My, <laughs> my muse, my hero, um, who I, uh, I mean, I try to do my best Andy Bacevich impression every day, you know. Um, so, uh, so what does that, what does that mean? Uh, that means that, uh, Andy, I don't know if you're listening, but when you get the job, um, I could probably move to DC for a few years, uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's some undersecretary positions. I mean, we're, we're colleagues and I, and I like to think we're friends, you know, Andy. So keep that in mind. Nah, I'm kidding. We've, we've joked around about this sort of stuff, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's great to see the people on that list 
And, um, and, and one of the most important things the president does, of course, is appoint advisors uh, who he delegates to. And we've seen how important this is uh, a few times. We saw Bush appoint probably the worst modern presidential national security cabinet uh, in history and, yeah. and probably the most dangerous. Uh, so we've seen that. Um, and we've seen Trump make some doozies himself, right, of appointments. And, and we see that, you know, who they pick is like wildly important. And I, I really, really hope against hope that Bernie will get outside the beltway when he starts making his pick. I mean, look, I know that like academia and the best and the brightest didn't work out so well for old Kennedy, but I would argue maybe he picked the wrong one. Um, Bernie, I know you're thinking this already, but like, and I know you're not listening to this because I'm not important, but look, like if I was talking to the Bernie people, I'd be like, yo, Matt Doss, like whoever, don't pick from what has been put in front of you by the D.C. establishment when it comes to foreign policy. Like, don't pick the opposition in the wings of the Democratic Party like Obama did on so many things. For example, on economic policy, when he loaded up the team that was in charge of his response to the Great Recession with some of the very people who helped make the Great Recession possible. And then wondered why the growth that came almost exclusively benefited the 1%. It's like, well, you picked Larry Summers and Tim Geithner, okay? These guys are Wall Street faves, okay? So don't do that on foreign policy, you know? And, and that's, the, that's the fear of, of any Democratic administration is what they'll do is they'll get in and they'll be like, well, uh, the current administration is shit, so we're going to go back to the old hands. And so that's how you end up with, like, you know, John Brennan's and, and Leon Panetta's you know, like, like Obama did. And it's like, yeah, okay, they're better than Cheney, but like, that's a bad bar. Like, that's a bad bar. Like your bar is too low. Like if robot heart Cheney is the bar, we're fucked, dude. Like, look at the universities, look at, look at some of the outside, you know, progressive foreign policy organizations and thinkers. We don't have to pick former CIA hacks just because they have that vaunted word, right? What is it? Experience. Oh, they've got experience. What if their experience has been wrong every time? You know, like then, then, then I, I, then like, honestly, some of the guys that have served in these, in these democratic administrations and especially the Republican ones are so bad, so bad. Like Paul Wolfwick was so bad that I swear on the God I barely believe in, that if you literally went to Washington Square Park right after the weed runs out in New York City and randomly plucked somebody out of the, you know, the, off the bench and said, hey, you're the younger Secretary of Defense for policy, we would have been better off. We would have been better off. That's how bad these guys are. So, yeah, that's a ramble. But, yeah, I'm really hoping that Bernie puts some good people in there, especially because he is older. And that's why the vice presidential pick is key. And maybe we'll talk about that or maybe next time. But, um, yeah, you got to put people in. Uh, base of us even being considered for Secretary of Defense is amazing. I mean, it, it's the equivalent of if Obama would have made Liz Warren Secretary of the Treasury. You know what I mean? Like right after the crash. I mean, that's, I mean, I got to give Liz Warren credit on that stuff, you know? Like that, it would have been that the equivalent. It's like it's like picking somebody to dismantle the system. It's beautiful. The fact that Basevich would even be shortlisted to me is is a huge thing, and I'm I'm really proud to read it. Okay, that's enough.
I will not detain you long. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time.